فحري حطيب والعود والفرح والخير ممدود يا هلا بالله من سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويرفر لكم ذنوبكم وما يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحج حج محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار عباد الله Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome brothers and sisters to this class, the life of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, we're resuming again today after a break of a couple of weeks or so. In the previous session, we talked about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the early years of his life. Um, we talked about important events leading up to his prophethood um, and we talked at some length about the history of the Kaaba, uh, also about the cave of Hira and some stories of individual people in the pursuit of the truth such as Salman al-Farisi So inshallah we'll go to today's quiz, which was taken from the last session we had two or three weeks ago. First question there on the screen, what is the Kaaba and who built it originally? If you can type your answers on the screen. MashaAllah, first answer there, the Kaaba was the first house that was built for mankind to remember and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was originally built by Prophet Ibrahim salam, and his son Ismail. MashaAllah, well done. Good answer. Question two, why did the Quraysh decide to rebuild the Kaaba and how old was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then? Why did the Quraysh decide to rebuild the Kaaba? And how old was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then? MashaAllah, answer on the screen there. The Quraysh decided to rebuild the Kaaba due to the Great Flood and other natural causes. The wall of the Kaaba began to break down and the damage was so bad they were afraid the walls would collapse any time. Therefore, they decided to rebuild it. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was 35 years old at that time. And another answer there. Kaaba is the house of worship and originally built by Prophet Ibrahim and his son Ismail. Okay. Very good answers there. Next question, Why? Uh, what sort of money did the Quraysh decide to use to pay for the reconstruction? What sort of money did the Quraysh decide to use to pay for the reconstruction of the Kaaba? Okay, answer on the screen, the Quraysh decided to use lawful money only for the reconstruction of the Kaaba. 
not the money that came from unlawful sources. Okay, very good. So they used only halal or lawful money. That's what they decided. Um, even though this was before the revelation to the Prophet ﷺ, they decided they wouldn't use any of that tainted sort of money earned from interest, from prostitution, or any other sort of unjust practices. Um, when they ran out of money, they ended up shortening the Kaaba from on one side so that they made it into the shape of a square rather than the original shape, which was a rectangle, and that was to save money. So this also is a sign of how deeply the Quraysh were in wrongdoing, that there wasn't enough lawful money in such a very wealthy trading city to rebuild the Kaaba completely to its original size and shape. So the area of the Kaaba which they left out was what we refer to today as Al Hijr. So that's the semicircle part you see outside one of the outside of the of the Kaaba as it's built today. So they settled for a smaller version and they put a mud brick wall called Al Hijr to indicate the original size of the Kaaba. Okay. Next question. Who finally stepped forward to begin knocking down the walls of the Kaaba? If you can recall back, um, the uh, people in the Quraysh, um, they were a bit afraid of demolishing the Kaaba. Who, what is the name of the person who finally, finally stepped forward to begin knocking down the walls of the Kaaba? Okay, mashallah, answer on the screen there. Al-Walid ibn al mughira and he was the chief of the Mahzum clan in Quraysh. And why did the Quraysh fear demolishing the walls of the Kaaba? Why did the Quraysh fear demolishing the walls of the Kaaba? MashaAllah, answer on the screen, even though Quraysh were mushrikeen or idol worshippers, they believed and feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and felt guilty about demolishing the walls of the Kaaba. They thought it would be a major sin if they start demolishing it. Okay, so they thought that they might earn Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's angry anger and be punished for that. Which tribes performed the building reconstruction? Which tribes performed the building reconstruction of the Kaaba? Okay, all of the tribes of Quraysh joined in that building work and the work was divided up amongst all of the tribes so that each tribe was responsible for rebuilding a part of it. Okay, so that was all of the tribes did that. And what happened when it was time to put the black stone in its position in the Kaaba? What happened when it was time to put the black stone into position in the Kaaba? Okay, very good. There was a dispute that broke out among the Quraysh for who would have the honour of lifting the black stone into its position, and a fight broke out. Very good. And um, uh, the construction it was completed without any kind of incident. So then that dispute broke out amongst the Quraysh over who would have that honour of lifting the black stone into position. So when they were rebuilding the Kaaba, every tribe took responsible, responsibility for building part of it or one side of it, but that problem came up when it was time to place the black stone. 
and one of the um, one of the clans, Banu Abdundar, gathered all of their men and came in front of the Kaaba with a pot of blood. If you can recall the story from last time, they placed this pot of blood in front of everybody, and they all stuck their hands into the blood and then pulled them out. In other words, they were telling everyone that this is what will happen if we don't place the black stone in its place. So it's like pledging to fight to the death. So it was pretty serious. Okay. And how was fighting averted over placement of the black stone? How did they avoid getting into a big fight over the incident of the placing of the black stone? Inshallah, the answer on the screen, the oldest man of the Quraysh, Abu Umayya ibn Mughira said, the first man to walk into the Kaaba will be given the complete authority to judge between us. First person to walk in was Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they said, Al-Amin, the truthful and the trustworthy one, we all agree. Okay, so they uh, came to that agreement that because the first person to walk in was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they all agreed that he would be given complete authority over how to place the black stone because they knew he would not be biased towards any of the clans. So they gave him complete authority regarding that placement of the black stone. So what he did then he brought a piece of cloth, picked up the black stone and placed it in, on the cloth. Then he asked one person from each clan to hold the cloth from one side. Then they all raised it up together at the same time, and therefore every tribe participated in lifting the black stone. And when they all raised it, the Prophet ﷺ picked up the black stone and placed it in its position. So it was the Prophet ﷺ who placed the black stone in its spot, and this was the second time that the Kaaba had been built. Um, and also this dispute, it wasn't just a, a minor thing, this thing dragged on for around three or four days or so. So it was, it was pretty serious and uh, could have very easily uh, broken out into a major fight and um, you know this is a bit of a lesson we need to learn as well that when we see people amongst us disputing and getting into these kind of things um, it starts out as something small and then ends up as something huge uh, and this is a quality we need to get rid of getting so emotional and upset over minor stuff Question 9. When the Muslims conquered Makkah, the Prophet ﷺ considered rebuilding the Kaaba. Why did he not proceed? When the Muslims conquered Makkah, the Prophet ﷺ considered rebuilding the Kaaba. Why did he not proceed with that? Okay, answer on the screen, the Prophet ﷺ did not proceed to rebuild the Kaaba back to the original form because the people had just become Muslim and they were new to Islam and their faith was not strong at that time. Okay, so at that time their Islam was soft and their Iman was weak and it may have been a trial for them if the Prophet ﷺ decided to reconstruct the Kaaba at that time again. True or false, kissing or touching the black stone is a voluntary act of worship. Is it true or false, kissing or touching the black stone is a voluntary act of worship? Um, okay, there's one of each answer there, so probably the, the best answer is that it's false, even though it is optional or a voluntary thing to do, 
but it's not actually an act of worship. It's an act of um, utmost respect commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu anhu, he said, had I not seen the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kissing you, I would not have done so. Last question, in the years leading up to the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a, was a solitary man who believed in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knew the truth and he worshipped Allah ta'ala the best way that he could. He died before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received revelation, but he will enter paradise. Who was he? Very good. He was Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. And um, his son, of course, was Sa'id ibn Zayd, one of the ten given the good news of paradise while he was still alive. And um, in that story, um, his son Sa'id, he went to the Prophet and inquired about his father. He wanted to know what will be the faith of his father because he died before prophethood. And the Prophet told Sa'id, your father will come on the day of judgment as a nation alone. Okay, so mashallah, very good answers to the questions there for the quiz from last time. Going to move on today and discuss how the people were being prepared to accept the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and it was from the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa taala that people were being prepared for the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in various ways. Some of these are as follows, and the first one there: the previous prophets gave their people good news of the coming of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Prophet Ibrahim السلام, asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send a messenger from among the Arabs and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered his supplication by sending Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Holy Quran A'udhu billahi min ash rajim Rabbana wabaat fihim rasoolam minhum yatlu wa alayhim ayatika wa yuallimuhumun kitaba wal hikmat now Lord send amongst them a messenger of their own and indeed Allah Ta'ala answered their supplication by sending Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who shall recite to them your verses and instruct them in the book the Quran and Al-Hikmah or the Sunnah and sanctify them verily you are the Almighty the All-Wise Elsewhere in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that he revealed good news of the coming of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to earlier prophets. In particular, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the good news that Prophet Isa or Jesus gave to his people. وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِلَ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ مُصَدِّقَدْ لِمَا بَيْنِ يَدَيَّ مِنَ التَّوْرَاتِ وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولُ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ اسْمُهُ أَحْمَدْ فَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ قَالُوا هَذَا سِحْرٌ مُبِينٌ And remember when Isa or Jesus, son of Mary, said, O children of Israel, I am the messenger of Allah Ta'ala to you confirming the Torah which came before me and giving good news of a messenger to come after me, whose name shall be Ahmad. But when he, when he or Ahmad, that's Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, came to them with clear proofs, they said, this is plain magic. The native dwellers of Medina from Els and Khazraj tribes 
who then became known as the Ansar, related that the Jews of Medina would inform them about the imminent appearance of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They knew that he was from the Arabs and they were waiting for him. The fact that the Ansar were previously told about the coming of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is one of the main reasons that prompted them to believe in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as soon as he invited them to Islam. Salama ibn Salama ibn Waqsh, a man from the Ansar, was one of the Muslim participants in the Battle of Badr. He said, we had a Jewish neighbor who lived among the clan of Banu Abdul Ashhal, which was an idol-worshipping clan. Just prior to the advent of the Prophet wasallam, this neighbor left his house, came out to us, and sat in the gathering of Abdul Ashhal. That day I was the youngest person in the gathering. I was wearing a robe and lying down in the courtyard of my family. He, his Jewish neighbor, mentioned resurrection or the day of judgment, the accountability, the scale in which good and bad deeds will be measured, paradise and the hellfire. So he was speaking to people who were polytheists and idol worshippers, people who didn't believe in those things like resurrection after death. And here he's talking about his own clan, the Banu Abdul Ashhal clan. They said to him, what? Do you really believe in all of that stuff, that people will be resurrected after death to a place that contains a fire? Do you really believe that in that place that they will be rewarded for their deeds? He said, yes, and whose name oaths are taken, I believe this. He then said that in exchange for having his share of that fire in the hereafter, he wished to enter the greatest oven here on earth after it is first heated and before it is then closed upon him. And that's how badly he wanted to be saved from that fire, the hell fire, tomorrow, meaning in the hereafter. They said to him, they said to Salama bin Salama of the Ansar, good gracious, and what proof is there of that happening? He said, a prophet will be sent in the direction of these lands. And he pointed towards Makkah. They asked, and when will we see him? The Jewish man looked at me, and I was one of the youngest people among them, and said, if this boy lives a normal lifespan, he'll live through this time. Salama the Ansari went on to say, I was still alive when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was alive in our midst. We believed in him, but that very same Jewish man disbelieved in him out of jealousy and as a form of transgression. We said to him, were you not, of, were you not the one who said about him what you said? He said, yes, but that's not him. So this Jewish man of Medina, who was knowledgeable, he knew that there was a prophet coming from the direction of Makkah. He was aware of hell and heaven, and he knew that the time for the arrival of the prophet was very near. However, when the prophet ﷺ was sent, this Jewish man refused to follow him. And there are many narrations showing this attitude of the Jews. He knew about the coming of the prophet ﷺ. In fact, many of them were there in Medina, because they were expecting his arrival. When the Arabs of Medina would dispute over something, the Jews would tell the tribes of Aus and Khazraj that one day there is going to be a prophet sent among us, and when, when that happens, we're going to kill you like the people of Ad were killed. So this turned out to be a preparation of Aus and Khazraj tribes for the coming of the Prophet by the Jews. And when Aus and Khazraj met Muhammad وسلم, in Mecca, they immediately believed because they knew that this was the person that the Jews used to talk about. In fact, after their meeting, they went back to their tents and they said, this is the man the Jews have been threatening us with, so let's follow him first. This means before the Jews accepted Islam, 
before they accept Islam and attack them, the Ansar. So the Ansar were kind of in a hurry to believe, but then the Jews, they refused to follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abdullah bin Amr radiallahu anhu said by Allah Ta'ala, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is described in the Torah with the same description that he has given in the Quran. O Prophet, we have sent you as a witness, a bearer of glad tidings, a warner, and a protector of the illiterate ones, the Arabs. You are my slave and messenger. I have named you al mutawakkil the one who relies on Allah Ta'ala. He, and now he's in the, talking in the third person, but still referring to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is neither rude nor harsh, and he is not one who raises his voice in the marketplace during disputes. He does not reciprocate evil with another evil, rather he pardons and forgives. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will not cause him to die until he establishes through him Al-Millah al awja that is the religion of Prophet Ibrahim, which the Arabs had changed and distorted, making them say, none has the right to be worshipped but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Through him, Allah ta'ala will open eyes that are blind, ears that are deaf, and hearts that are covered up. It was from the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that people were being prepared for the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in various ways. So that was the first one that the previous prophets gave their people good news of the coming of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the second one, before the advent of Islam, scholars from the people of the book, at least the sincere ones among them, gave good news of the coming of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For example, while Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu was traveling from one land to another in search of the truth, he spent some time under the guidance of a Christian monk who once said to Salman, Verily the time of a prophet who will be sent with the religion of Ibrahim draws near. He will appear in the land of the Arabs and he will migrate to a land that is situated between Haratain, land that is replete with volcanic rocks, and this refers to the lands that border Medina to the east and to the west. Between them, between the Haratain, or in other words, Al Medina, uh, date palm trees. He will have with him signs that are not hidden. He eats from what is given to him as a gift, but he doesn't eat what is given as charity. And the stamp of prophethood is located between his shoulders. If you're able to go to those lands, then do so. Eventually, Salman anhu, made it to Medina, Though in the process he was wrongfully taken captive and turned into a slave. Shortly after Salman arrived there, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrated to Medina. Wanting to put the monk's words to the test, Salman radiallahu anhu went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and gave him some food, saying that it was being given as charity. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave the food to his companions but he did, did not eat any of it himself. Later on, Salman returned with more food, and this time he told the Prophet وسلم, that he was giving him the food, not in charity, but as a gift. The Prophet وسلم, gave some of the food to his companions, and he ate some himself. Then on another occasion, Salman saw with his own eyes the third and final sign, the stamp of prophethood between the Prophet's shoulders. Salman then immediately embraced Islam. The general state of affairs prior to the advent of Islam, the coming mission of prophethood was being hinted at in many ways to the Prophet For instance, Jabir ibn Samura radiallahu anhu reported that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, once said, Verily, I know a stone in Mecca that would extend greetings of peace to me before I was sent as a prophet. Indeed, I still know it now. Also, even before 
the angel Jibreel السلام, appeared to the Prophet وسلم, for the first time in the cave of Hira, the Prophet وسلم, would see true dreams. Whatever he saw, whatever he would see in a dream would occur in exactly the same manner in real life. The Prophet وسلم, also felt an inward change that occurred prior to his prophethood. Solitude and worship were made beloved to him. And he would seek out solitude and worship in the cave of Hira, which is situated just northwest of Mecca. He would remain in the cave for a number of nights at a time, sometimes for 10 nights and sometimes for even longer, for upwards of an entire month. And between stays in the cave, the Prophet وسلم, would return to his home, remain there only for a short while, then when he gathered more supplies, he would return to the cave. Revelation descends to the Prophet وسلم, for the first time. And until the Prophet reached the age of 40, he would seek solitude in the cave of Hira, where he would worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and contemplate the universe around him. He would remain in the cave for a number of nights, leaving it only when he ran out of supplies. He would then go to his home, get the provisions he needed, and return to the cave for another succession of days. Imam al-Bukhari related that Aisha radiallahu anha said, the first form of revelation that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was initiated with was the good or true dream that he would see in his sleep. Every dream that he saw became true, like the light of the morning, that his events occurred in the exact same manner that he had seen them occur in his dreams. Next, Solitude was made beloved to him, and so he would isolate himself in the cave of Hira, where he would worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a number of nights before returning to his family and getting more provisions for the same purpose. He would return to his wife Khadija radiallahu anha and take a quantity of provisions that would last him a similar number of nights. This continued until the truth came to him while he was in the cave of Hira. The angel Jibreel السلام, came to him and said, Iqra, recite. Angel Jibreel came to Muhammad وسلم, in his angelic form, and that happened twice, and not in the form of a man as he did at other times. Jibreel السلام, came to the Prophet وسلم, and told him, Iqra, Recite. And this word Iqra, it has two meanings. One of them is read and the other is recite. In this situation, it means recite. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded and said, I cannot read. Jibreel alayhi salam grabbed Muhammad and squeezed him and then he released him and said Iqra. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded again, I cannot read. So Jibreel alayhi salam held him a second time and pressed him hard again and said, Iqra. This happened three times until Jibreel السلام, eventually recited the first verses of the Qur'an in Surah Al-Araq. Iqra, Bismi Rabbika al-Ladhi khalaq, khalaqani insana min anaq. Iqra, wa Rabbuka al-Akram, al-Ladhi allama bil-Qalam, allamani insana ma lam ni'alam. Recite in the name of your Lord who created, created man from a clinging substance. Recite and your Lord is the most generous who taught by the pen, taught man that which he knew not. So this was the first encounter between the Prophet وسلم, and the angel Gabriel. Messenger of Allah وسلم, was left terrified by that incident. He went back home and he immediately went to his wife Khadija anha, and said, wrap me up in a garment, wrap me up in a garment. The Prophet وسلم, was shivering and he was feeling so cold that he was asking his wife to wrap him up. The Prophet وسلم, was afraid due to what happened. Also, he disliked anything to do with the jinn, spirits or sorcery. He was afraid that what happened to him was similar to what happened with sorcerers. 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explained the incident to his wife Khadija radiallahu anha and she responded at, and said, No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never forsake you because of your righteousness. You support the needy, you help the poor, you are generous towards the guests. What happened to you cannot be from shaitan. So because of the prior conduct of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Khadija radiallahu anha knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would protect him. Then Khadija took the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to her uncle, and in some narrations it's her cousins, Waraka bin Nawthal. Waraka was a man who became Christian, and he was literate. And he had scrolls from the Bible which he would study. Waraka asked Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to narrate the entire event to him. Waraka responded and he said, This is the greatest angel, Jibreel, who descended to Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Waraka bin Nawfal immediately knew that this was the angel Jibreel and that he had revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a revelation similar to what was given to Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Then Waraka bin Nawfal said, I wish that I were a strong young man. I wish to be alive when your people expel you from your land. So this was a surprise, a surprise to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How could that happen? And the Prophet وسلم, had every right to question what Waraka was saying because Muhammad وسلم, was the most beloved and admired man in Makkah. He belonged to the noblest family in Makkah, Banu Hashim, and he had no problem with the people to give them any reason to drive him out of Makkah. And lastly, the kind of culture that he was living in, it was unacceptable to drive somebody out of his own land. In the tribal societies, the only way to survive in the harsh environment of the desert was to hold on together. And so there was extreme loyalty within the tribes. So the Prophet said, And will they indeed expel me? Yes, said Waraka. No man has ever come with what you come with except that he has been treated as an enemy. If I am alive, when that day of yours comes, I will indeed support you and help you a great deal. Shortly after, Waraka died and the revelation stopped for a while. Waraka was a wise man who studied history. He knew exactly what happens when truth and falsehood collide. He knew that even though Muhammad وسلم, was admired by his people, but because he will call them to Islam, this is what would happen to him. And what Waraka bin Nawfal said turned out to be true. These words of Waraka were an early warning to Muhammad وسلم, for what was coming ahead, that it will not be easy. The first word given to the Prophet وسلم, was Iqra. And what that means for us as Muslims today is we are an Ummah that reads and studies, an Ummah that learns. This one word has changed an entire illiterate society and made them scholars of the world. And at that time the followers of Muhammad وسلم, were illiterate, but these words inspired them to learn. And within a very short time the Muslim Ummah became the most educated scholarly nation on the face of the earth. The number of scholars that this Ummah has produced is unsurpassed. When you look at the quality of these scholars, you find uniqueness. They don't resemble the scholars from any other nation. Take, for example, the memory of Imam al-Bukhari. His ability to memorize over a quarter of a million hadith. Or for another example, Imam Shafi'i, who said, when I open a book, I have to cover one page at a time because I memorize everything and I don't want the information on two pages to mix. So he had something like a photographic memory. Or another scholar, Al-Wafa ibn Aqil, who wrote an encyclopedia of over 300 volu of volumes. Unfortunately, it didn't survive in the original copy. It was in the library of Baghdad, which was destroyed. But it was the power 
of the word Iqra, which brought this change in the Ummah. But with the Prophet the situation was different. He did not learn how to read and write. For him, the word meant recite, to recite and the, repeat the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas for us, it means that we have to learn how to read and write. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be illiterate and it was a part of his decree. Also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Anqabut وَمَا كُنْتَ تَتْلُقَ مِنْ قَبْدِهِكَ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَلَا تَخُطْنْتُهُ بِيَمِينِكَ إِذَا لَرَتَا بَدَا مُبْطِلُونَ And you did not recite before it any scripture, nor did you inscribe one with your right hand. Otherwise, the falsifiers would have had cause for doubt. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not learn any scripture before the Qur'an and he did not have the ability to read and write. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was illiterate. Why should Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have to learn to read and write after Islam and what purpose would it serve? For us reading, it's our key to knowledge. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was being taught by the angel Jibreel. And there is nothing that books would offer the Prophet ﷺ when he's receiving knowledge directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So iqra means recite in his case, but for us it means read. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also makes a promise in Surah Al-Qanam. Noon wal qalami wa ma yasturun by the pen and what they inscribe. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes an oath about something, as in this verse, that indicates that it's something something which is very important. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made an oath in the name of the pen, and it's mentioned that in the battle of Ba'as, who were the prisoners of war, were offered freedom if they taught ten believers how to read and write. So that was the importance that Islam gave to knowledge. We are an ummah of knowledge, of scholarship, but unfortunately today we are lagging behind in this duty. If we don't have an interest in studying, then the least that we can do is to make sure that our children don't inherit this fault. Some children, they love to read and some don't. And there are some common characteristics among the children who love to read and they are Firstly, their parents are people who love reading. The early years of development in the child is the process of imitation. So when the child sees his parent with a book, he or she will automatically start playing with books and magazines, even though he or she isn't able to read yet. The child would just love to imitate. So in your house, in front of your children, you should read so you can give them a good example. Secondly, they grow up in a print-rich environment a house which has many books or a library, so they have access to books. And as they grow up, they can have their own library. Also their parents, they'll often take them to bookstores. Also these are children who are not addicted to screens, like the highly addictive games that you find on computers and iPads and programs on TV and all that stuff. So these are just a few useful tips for parents. As for developing the skill of reading, it doesn't mean that you read everything. There are some forms of reading which might be harmful in the early stages of development. Once in the early days of Medina, the Prophet وسلم, he saw Umar ibn Khattab عنه, reading some scrolls of Torah. The Prophet وسلم, he became so angry that his face became red and he criticized Umar for reading from the Torah. But that wasn't a permanent ban. It was only in the early days until the Muslims developed a solid foundation. Then later on that order was abrogated and the Prophet said, I have prohibited you from reading the stories of Banu Israel 
but now I'm allowing you to read it. However, don't believe in it and don't disbelieve in it. In other words, there might be many statements which have no verification via the Qur'an or Hadith, then we shouldn't believe in it or reject it. فحري حطيب والعود والفرح والخير ما